Mark Rosano, Mark Rosano Productions. <laughs> Contract and I was put under contract to uh, Columbia Pictures. Um, or shall I go even back even farther? No, you have to read the book for that. Um, Stephanie Powers, one from the heart. I'm sure you can get it on Amazon. Anything we don't cover tonight, you can buy this and get the Almost Amazon. everything. Almost. <laughs> but, um, so I was, um, um, I was told that I was going to go to England to work uh, with uh, the great... Tulula Banke. And uh, uh, I, of course, I knew all about her because my mother used to listen to, she had a radio program on that was very, very popular. She also had early days of television she was on, and she was very uh, prominent. Uh, her, her guest appearance on the uh, Lucy show was very prominent. And uh, do you think we could put the lights on out there? Yeah, could we? <laughs> could we put the lights on out there so we can see each other? Could we? Wouldn't that be nicer? There are people oh, here. There you are. Oh, that's so much better. How are you? Great. I need that good. Isn't this cute? I'm adding to the local economy. She just bought that this afternoon. Isn't that beautiful? So anyway, so the story goes like this. We arrive in England. I was still uh, young enough that I had to have my mother with me, so mom and I uh, got on the plane and we went to England and uh, we we're all excited about this fabulous actress we're going to work with. And it was just around the time when Betty Davis and, and Joan Crawford had done those movies, uh, uh, a Sweet Charlotte and uh, whatever happened to and, Baby Jane. And whatever happened to Baby Jane. So they were this. The Columbia and Hammer Films were interested in doing something with another great iconic movie, uh, a, a star of stage and screen, uh, Tallulah Bankhead. This was her first film in 20 years since Lifeboat. So we were all very nervous, very anxious. Tallulah arrived in London, and she remember was the scene of her greatest triumph in the theater. And at the time that she was a young actress arriving in London, the place to stay was the Ritz Hotel. But in the 1960s, the Ritz Hotel had fallen on bad times. It was a, a bit faded. It was a, like a dear old girl down at heel. And it wasn't maintained as well as it could have been. And on the side where you enter the Ritz Hotel, there were some very steep steps. They're kind of awkward steps, and they had a lip on the steps made of brass, which wasn't maintained. And so Tallulah, when she arrived, tripped on her way going up the stairs, and actually tripped and fell over backwards. Just happened that a photographer was there, and he took photographs of her falling, 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 and landing right on her derriere. Next morning in the newspaper, Photographs of Tallulah in all stages of her fall, landing straight on her rear, and the headline was Tallulah's triumphant return. <laughs> this put her into an immediate state of laryngitis. She went to her bed. All the doctors and all the king's men and all the king's horses couldn't put little Dumpty Dumpty together again, and uh, she was unconsolable. And the producers were getting a little bit worried. So they still had to keep their schedule. And the first day that the cast was all assembled, it was to be what's now called a table read. It was a reading of the screenplay around a table where all the actors and the directors would be and so that everybody would clear the air, get a chance to meet each other, hear the, 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 
the script come to life, and then you'd begin filming. It was Donald Sutherland's first film. I think he got a, an SAG card on our film. Did you recognize Donald Sutherland up there? I don't think it's in his filmography. <laughs> I don't think he admits to it. In any event, uh, and the other, uh, the other actors uh, in the piece were all very well-known theatrical uh, uh, actors, members of the Royal, Royal uh, the RSC, and members of the, um, uh, the National Theatre, Eutha Joyce and uh, Peter Vaughan. So here we are, all waiting for Tulu to arrive. The doors open, and in she walks, with two young men sort of holding her up from uh, uh, under each arm in a full-length mink coat with her hair dangling over her face. And as she walks in, she says, Oh, darling, it's wonderful to see you guys. It's wonderful. Carry on, carry on. I'll, I'll catch up with you. But... So we sat down, and so somebody else had to read her part. And they did, and we read the book. Oh, it's marvelous, marvelous, marvelous. <laughs> so, <laughs> so uh, we all adjourned, and um, the director was a bit uh, dismayed, but he had a very clever idea. I think it was actually on a Friday, and I think there was a weekend, so that we were going to start filming on the Monday. So what he had designed was to have a few days in the week, on location, where Tallulah would be called out to film one shot. She would come before lunch, she'd be made up, hair, wardrobe, ready. We'd all break for lunch, she'd get a touch-up after lunch, she'd do the first shot after lunch, distant shot, long shot, waving from the, or walking around or outside or something. Thank you very much, Tallulah, we'll see you tomorrow. That's all she did. And she did that for three or four days. So finally, at the end of the week, we were all invited to go and see what's called the rushes, or the, the filming that had transpired that, those previous days uh, that we could all take a look at. And, uh, and we were, all the cast was invited, which isn't normal. And Tallulah was right there with all of us, and she had to sit through everybody else's work and see one shot of her in the distance, way, 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 way. And it got her dander up. And it really, really, really did the job. And so, the true Tallulah started to come out, which was this extraordinary woman who was an amazing talent, uh, with a history that was uh, sort of unparalleled. Um, I could bore you with her entire history, but I won't go into that. There is a very, very good book about Tallulah. Um, uh, just to make, to tidy up Tallulah, um, we did become friends afterward. Um, my God, we went through a great deal together. We had dressing rooms right next to each other. Tallulah, who was frequently uh, al uh, alone in her dressing room, um, Oh, and it was her habit never to call anybody by their real name. Whether they were working together, she would always call them by their stage name or their the, ca uh, the character name in the film. And our dressing rooms were right next door to each other, above the sound stage at uh, at ABPC Boreham Wood Studios. And I'd hear this banging. Patricia. <laughs> Which she says throughout the film, she's always bellowing Patricia, and in real life as well. Yes, yeah, so well, she always called me Patricia. So she bang, Patricia, come here! And um, so I would come next door, and I think I was about 19 years old at the time. I would come next door, I'd open the door, and she'd be on the toilet stark naked. <laughs> this was not a pretty sight. <laughs> by any stretch of the imagination. <laughs> but this was, this was sort of typical of, uh, of the shock value that, uh, that Tallulah had. Now, fade out, fade in. Um, years later, millennium later, I think, about five years ago, I was approached to, uh, to do a play called Looped, uh, which was about the final day 
of post-production on Die, Die, My Darling. There was one line of dialogue that had to be looped. It's a process of dubbing over a badly, uh, God bless you. Is it all right? Didn't get any on your shoes, did you? I'm thrilled. Um, Patricia? Patricia! Um, so, uh, this one line of dialogue was crucial to the plot line, and so it was unavoidable, and Tallulah had to do it. In actual fact, um, it was done in New York, but in the play they had it being done in, they had her being flown out to California, uh, where she had a home, and it, anyway, but the event actually did happen. Looping, does everybody know what that means? It's yeah. loop, the film is on a loop, and you sit, and it goes beep, 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 and you say the line, all right. Well, she arrived four hours late for this session. Looped. <laughs> Hence the double entendre. Hence the title of the play. And, uh, and what occurred <laughs> was uh, six more hours of the most outrageous behavior, which somebody slipped a, sort of a, a tape and taped some of her diatribe, uh, her, her voluminous <laughs> expletives uh, that were coming out during this uh, session. And the author of the play based his play on this event. So I was asked to play Tallulah. And uh, there were lots of good jokes and all of that, and lots of good punchlines, but there was no story. There was no beginning, middle, and an end. And I always thought, a play has to have a beginning, middle, and an end. And as an audience, we want to go out saying, well, something happened to those characters on the play, on, on the stage, so that you feel somehow fulfilled. Because quite frankly, every drag queen in the world had her Tallulah in their repertoire. Yeah. And they'd do a hell of a lot better impersonation of her than I would. Or that she did sometimes. Or sometimes that she did. Yes. She was, of course, a gay icon. And that was something that she pandered to, in fact, throughout her life. Almost to the, to the point where it ruined her career because um, she, her, she self-destructed uh, as a result of her pandering to the audiences which egged her on to be more and more camp and more and more of this legendary, shocking uh, personality that she became. Did you know that, uh, um, uh, it is a fact, that Tennessee Williams wrote uh, Blanche Dubois for Tallulah Bankhead, and she turned it down. Why? Well, she was quoted as having said, uh, if I can get this right, uh, what would it look like? Uh, an aging southern woman playing an aging southern woman. <laughs> so. Stephanie Powers in loot, ladies and gentlemen. So that sort of uh, that was sort of uh, her attitude, but eventually she did do it in Florida at the Point Siena Playhouse. She did. And there were lines and lines and lines around the, around the theater. And uh, that night, um, she started to do the performance of her life. And somebody laughed in the audience. And the minute she got that laugh, as if they were waiting for her to send the whole process up, uh, she went right to it and really shanghaied herself. She started playing for the laughs, trying to play joking with the audience instead of staying in the character. And it was a catastrophe, from which she, she could never, ever recover. Uh, it, it was a scandal that went through all of the, uh, the Howard Halls of Broadway. Everybody knew about it. She, was, she made a mockery of the play. She made a mockery of herself. And, um, she was skewered by the critics, of course. And she was. Being so larger than life, <coughs> she did fall into the trap of becoming a caricature of herself. Of herself. As you said. And she did. And that's very much what you, what, a, a bit of what you see in this film. She began to caricature her, her own abilities. But there was one thing that she did do, which I, I, I tell you, I've never seen it before or since, and I've worked with an awful lot of people. 
There was a sequence, and you might recall it in the film, where we first meet, I'm coming, she's going to serve me tea. And she sits down into her close-up while she's reminiscing about her son. And then she breaks down into tears about her poor departed son. Well, she was having trouble getting some consistency. So the director just said, Tulu, just do it over and over again. We're not going to cut. Just keep doing it over and over again. So the camera would be right there, and she would stand up, and she would collect herself. And then she would sit down into the shot. Each time she sat into the shot, she was composed. And as she began to break down, reminiscing about her son, her eyes would fill with tears. There would be redness in her nose. There'd be a little dribble coming out, you know, a little. I remember the, the face would be ballooning with sorrow. She'd finish her dialogue. And then the Silvio Narizano, the director, would say, that's all right, Salula, now just stand up, give yourself a minute, and do it again. <coughs> she would stand up. All of that would disappear, as if it never happened. I can't do that in real life, <laughs> let alone in front of a camera. Uh, and, and, and she would transform herself and sit down and go through the same thing. And she did that about four times. Somewhere in there was the actress that everybody admired when she was so celebrated as being the greatest thing since blue cheese of her day. And uh, uh, to see it corrupted in that way was a bit... Uh, it was, it was sad, in a way. Although she didn't lead a sad life. She was, she was not poor. Uh, she, was, uh, she had a very nice apartment in, on 57th Did Street in New York. she have a pet tiger or lion or something? Oh, I think she, had that, she had an ocelot at one time. Is that what it was? I think it was an ocelot. That she would travel around with. But she had a very, <laughs> she had a funny life. Uh, uh, she would always watch uh, the, uh, the soap operas in the morning. You couldn't reach her in the morning. And she had these times when you could call her. But she would have to clear her schedule of, of soap operas before she'd speak to anybody on the phone. And then she'd have lunch. And then she was ready to receive her public. Every time I was in New York, I, I knew the hours. So I would wait until it would be the proper hour. And she had this lovely black maid who had been with her since childhood, it seemed, and uh, Willie May, and I would call her up and say, hello, Willie May, it's Stephanie Powers, uh, is Miss Bankhead available? And she'd go, oh, Miss Powers, that's good to say, I know Miss Bankhead, in one moment. And so she'd go over, and I'd hear her say, Miss Bankhead, is Stephanie Powers on the phone? And I'd hear her say, or something in the background, and she'd get to the phone, and she would say, Patricia, darling. <laughs> yeah, she was an original. I could tell you some other stories, but uh, 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 we clear the house. She, she, she was interested, but you should. If you have interest and you pick up one of the books, you, you'll definitely get an education from Tallulah. She was definitely uh, a pioneer, as it were. And... Uh, in the world of pioneers, we're actually sitting in the presence of a pioneer, according to PBS and the rest of us. You, in fact, are a pioneer because after starting out in films and the contract system and the studio system, being a contract player, television beckoned and the girl from Uncle was probably, I would say, your next big thing in the States. Well, I was Certainly sold. On <laughs> uh, my slavery, my slavery at Columbia ended. They sold my contract to MGM Studios to do because in my contract, as it would be with many contract players that they had developed, uh, you were not allowed to do television. Uh, there were television actors and movie actors, and never the twain should meet in those days. Now, of course, it's all different. They, there was a, a spin-off uh, of a t very successful television show called The Man From U.N.C.L.E. and it was going to be called The Girl From U.N.C.L.E. And MGM wanted me uh, and they negotiated for the remainder of my contract with Columbia. At that point I had done 15 motion pictures in three years. And uh, yeah, they worked us. 
They got their money's worth. <laughs> with, with some pretty incredible people, though, as well. With some extraordinary people. I mean, you've heard a lot of, sometimes you read about how much, uh, how uh, many people complained about the star system, those who were under contract, and indeed, you know, Betty Davis had a terrible time at, uh, at uh, Warner Brothers. She couldn't express herself, neither did um, uh, Catherine Hepburn. They had a difficult time. But on the whole, and even off the whole, it was a fabulous, fabulous training ground. You had the support of a fabulous amount of talented people, from the hairdressers to the costumers. They taught you how to walk and talk at the same time in front of a camera. They really, really sent you to a finishing school that nobody could afford to go to these days. And they made you work. And those people that, were, um, that you were put in, in films with were some of the people that we all watch on Turner Broadcasting and AMC and are called icons of the, of the motion picture industry, which we all know and love. They were alive and well. They were working, they were functioning, they were doing, producing their own films. Uh, uh, I remember running into, into uh, um, Burt Lancaster in the makeup department who's having something designed and they had a great chat with him. They were so interested and so helpful to the young contract players. And many of them would sort of adopt uh, uh, or become interested in one or two of them. In my case, I had the good fortune of having caught the eye of Joan Crawford. And um, she used to write me notes, little keys to you know, what I should do, when to turn my head, when don't look down. Uh, I remember she wrote me a particular note about saying that when I had opened the door uh, and walked into this scene, I looked down for a minute. And I looked back up and she said, never look down. It looks as if you're looking for your mark. If you look down, make sure you're looking down for a real reason. Otherwise, it makes you less of an actor, and it destroys your contact with the audience. Well, what an education to have gotten, get feedback from somebody like that, but to be in a studio and to continue to work and do film after film, and it's a, an extraordinary training, really. And there, you know, there was also this notion that you were going to, you know, obviously become something, and also grow up, and inherit the mantle of others in other roles, and you also thought the, uh, of longevity. You imagined that one day you'd be old enough to play certain roles and all the way into your dotage. Uh, that really was in people's minds. Uh, obviously today it's, it's hardly possible unless it's in the theater. Um, and certainly I feel, I feel great compassion for some of the young actors who are uh, really uh, trying to give it a go. It's a tough, tough business now. And I don't think I'd have quite the uh, uh, courage to enter it. Uh, I don't know about in these that. days. How did experiment in terror come out of Columbia in those days as well? <laughs> well, that's in the book, but I'll tell you the story anyway. But at the t I had um, I had auditioned for Jerome Robbins um, in a part in West Side Story. I was 15 years old. And I, I got the job after 16 dance auditions and three screen tests. And, um, but then I, after three months of rehearsals with, with them, and it was, uh, talk about a school, a tough school. Um, I was the only minor on the film. I really wasn't, I was a jet, I was Velma. And uh, I wasn't crucial to the film. So uh, they replaced me with a girl who did the part on Broadway who looked a bit too old for the part, but never mind, it was okay. Uh, in the meantime, at the studio, I was introduced to a young uh, writer, director, actor, who was making a, a film and liked to work with people who haven't had much experience acting, but that certainly was me. The film was made, he asked me to play the leading uh, lady in the film, and there was a producer called Jerry Wald, at 20th Century Fox, who was a great supporter of Tom Laughlin, who was the, remember Billy Jack? Well, that was Tom Laughlin. And, and Tom Laughlin wrote and directed and, and co-starred with 
or I co-starred with him, uh, in this film called uh, We Are All Christ. You won't find it <laughs> on my... What a title. <laughs> you won't find it in any, uh, uh, anybody's collection. Uh, but it was interesting that Jerry Wald was a great supporter of Tom's, and he had a private screening room in his house, and he invited an awful lot of people from the industry to come and see this film. And he had a screening of 20th Century Fox and all that. So in a way, it was kind of my formal or informal introduction into Hollywood. And um, as a result, I was asked to join the various um, um, talent programs uh, that existed in those days at the various studios. In, in my case, it was three studios, MGM, 20th Century Fox, and Columbia, where they had coaches, drama coaches, and they would work with the contract players as well as the people that they thought might be uh, potential contract players on scenes that they would present to the casting people and they would present to the talent department. And if they liked the scene, they would put it on screen and some of the, they would show off some of their contract players for the possibility of them getting roles in other films and also the potential of perhaps signing some new ones. So I was preparing a scene at uh, 20th Century Fox where Sandy Meisner, who created the Neighborhood Playhouse, was the coach. At MGM, where Zena Provendy, who was a protege of Stella Adler's, was the coach. And um, at Columbia, where Les Mahoney, who was um, with, uh, the, 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 I can't remember the name of the theater company in, in San Francisco that he, that he headed. Anyway, he was the coach. Well, one day I was late for class at Columbia, and I used to have a sort of side way that I could maneuver my, myself through the, 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 the labyrinth of Columbia pictures on Gower Street in, in Hollywood. Um, and I knew uh, the man at the gate, so he'd say, hi, kid, you know, go the back way. And it was through the editing department, and they had swinging doors and a very narrow corridor. And I was pushing my way through these swinging doors, and I swung a door, and I swung it right into the face of a man who was wearing the same sunglasses that I was wearing. Now, that's only significant because these sunglasses were the latest thing on the French Riviera. <laughs> And in those days, anything that was the latest thing on the French Riviera would take about three years to get to Los Angeles. Now it takes three hours. <laughs> so he said to me, where did you get those glasses? And I was a very cocky little kid in my sports car. I said, well, my friend Lance Rivetlo brought them to me from, from Cannes. He was driving in the, the Grand Prix. And I said, where did you get yours? And he said, I was at the Grand Prix. <laughs> and he said, what do you do here? And I said, well, I'm, I'm, I'm an actress. He said, oh, really? Are you any good? <laughs> and I said, uh, well, yes, of course I am. And he said, well, I'm a director. He said, you ought to come up and see me. I'm making a movie here. And I said, well, I can't see you right now. I'm late for class. He said, well, come up after class. He said, I'm on the fourth floor. My name is... Blake Edwards. <laughs> and he cast me in a movie with um, uh, Lee Remick and Glenn Ford called Experiment in Terror, and that put me under contract to Columbia. And lucky she's girl. And you were I was Lee's very, little sister, right? Very lucky. Lee's little sister in the. I was Lee's little, little sister. And then, as we were saying, you were sold, and how did that work? We, we, you were sold to MGM? I didn't get anything for it. <laughs> no, I, didn't, I didn't make a dime, no. Uh, they sold my contract to MGM, uh, and uh, they bought me out of the rest of the contract at, uh, at uh, Columbia. And uh, unfortunately, well, fortunately for everybody, there's always these, you can see the glass half empty or the half glass half full. It, every experience was a, was a blessing in disguise for me at the, in those days. The Man From U.N.C.L.E. had been on for two years and was very successful. And the Girl From U.N.C.L.E., uh, when we came on the air, um, the, the producer, I think we call it Alzheimer's, 
these days, but nobody really realized uh, that he was suffering from something. And just about the time after doing 29 episodes in one year, that was what we did. Which in never days. happens today, never. The Man from Uncle and the Girl from Uncle were canceled. And Norman Felton, who was supposed to be going in there, our producer, fighting for both of us, wound up in the hospital and shortly thereafter passed away. But it opened the door to uh, uh, an extraordinary uh, thing called television. Well, and Girl from and Uncle it was, was yeah, the first. It was, I, we didn't know this at the time. But it's so cool. But it, it was the first time in the history of television that a woman was not only the featured player, but the star of an hour-long television series. Pioneer in television. I don't know why we didn't make anything of it. It just went right by everybody, and I wasn't told about that until years later. I mean, only recently, when I guess people started to talk about things like that. And once that door was opened, it led to something else. Jeremy is going to run a clip. I don't know if any of you have ever heard of this show or remember this show. I don't think Stephanie's very identifiable with this show. But put that up, Jeremy, and we'll take a look. <laughs> We know that so. This is my boss, Jonathan Hart, a self-made millionaire. He's quite a guy. This is Mrs. H. She's gorgeous. She's one lady who knows how to take care of herself. By the way, my name is Max. I take care of both of them, which ain't easy. Because when they met, it was murder. Not only uh, did we have the most extraordinary time together, you never you hear that from an awful lot of people, but uh, life dealt us some very interesting cards, uh, uh, unhappy, uh, unhappily interesting cards. Um, my great love, William Holden, died uh, in an accident, and two weeks later, Natalie Wood died in an accident. So it was a very a dramatic time for us both. We had already, you know, done reasonably well with the show. Uh, we, we had to carry on. We were uh, obliged. We had, he had families, I had families. We were all, you know, committed by contract to carry on with the show. And the show became, and Lionel uh, became very much a stabilizing force for both of us. So unlike most people who say, you know, we really were such a family on that show. Um, those events dealt us some uh, very unusual cards. So I think that will always be one of the contributing factors that cemented our relationship and cemented our relationship with Lionel until his death. Uh, and uh, RJ and I have a have a, a, a great friendship that carries on today. And, and people think, used to think that you were married in real life. Yes, and we were to other people, though. <laughs> <laughs> and Heart to Heart was five seasons. The, the, the actual hour-long show was five seasons, and uh, then we were sort of unceremoniously uh, canceled uh, by a new head of ABC, who, along with us, canceled about seven hours worth of primetime television, promptly dropping ABC from number one to number three, from which they never recovered, really, for many, many years. 
No one will remember the name of that man except me. <laughs> it's emblazoned <laughs> in my memory banks. Um, but you know, one door closes, another door opens, and as many times, uh, something has to come to an end before a new beginning can happen. So um, it did. Uh, I became much more involved uh, in the theater, professionally, and also my work in conservation took over a great deal of my life. And the William Holden Wildlife Foundation, which is probably more than half of your life at this point, would you say? What's the split between acting and the foundation? Well, I have to act to afford, afford the uh, airplane ticket to get to Kenya. <laughs> but uh, 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 there's another purpose for it now. Um, not that it sound too altruistic, but it is, uh, I love acting now. I probably enjoy acting in the theater more than I've ever enjoyed anything, any acting before uh, as much. Um, and interestingly, as a sidebar, not only did Stephanie recently tour in this play about Die Die My Darling playing to We finished that subject, did we? Yes. Or <laughs> she, oh, well, we talked last night for five hours, so if you have anything to do tonight after this, you might want to cancel it. But not only did she play Tallulah, she recently, a few, what, three, four summers ago, played in Sunset Boulevard playing Norma Desmond to incredible reviews and worked so hard and sang so beautifully and they probably don't realize what a wonderful singer you are and she was so wonderful in the show but the film that William Holden made so famous and there you are doing that on the stage playing Norma Desmond in the Glorious Swanson. That's great fun. We, were, we really had hopes that uh, that we were going to create another production of it and uh, Andrew Lloyd Webber wanted it, but he was at the time entertaining the idea of doing it in, the, in an opera house with an opera company um, with, in, in, in England. And so he didn't want it done uh, in any other way. I saw Andrew uh, last summer and he said, what's happening? with Sunset Boulevard, and I said, why, you ought to know. <laughs> he only wrote it, but <laughs> it's a It's a shame, Robert, but it's such a grand piece. It's a wonderful piece. Uh, and it's, it's a thrill to be able to, uh, I'm now I'm old enough to be able to do all those wonderful, all those wonderful parts. Um, that's what one looks forward to as an actor. But what were we, but what we, were, we talking about? We were digressing. The William Holden okay. Wildlife Foundation, which oh, is such should a... We, what, should we just finish the Tallulah? Uh, yes, yes. Yeah, yeah, that's probably a good idea. Yes. We'll put a period at the end of that sentence. So I didn't do the play, Looped, that I had been offered. Um, Valerie Harper took it up. And Val and I are friends, and, uh, and we uh, talked about it, and she said, why didn't you want to do it? And I said, well, I, I, it just didn't have a story, it didn't have a, a shape to it. And she saw it more uh, as a, a situation comedy uh, with punchlines, and I saw it more as a play. So our points of view of, of, of attacking the, were, were slightly different. And they did a great deal of work on the show, and they toured it for a year, and then opened on Broadway. Unfortunately, it only lasted about six weeks. But Val was, was uh, nominated for a Tony, which was great for her. About five years ago, Valerie and I both uh, were diagnosed with uh, cancer of the lung. We had the same doctor, same oncologist, same everything, same, probably the same room. We were operated on, same surgery, four days apart. And so we would kept in touch with our recovery. So needless to say, it was a big shock to me. I was in Dubai doing um, a, uh, yeah, doing a production with David of David Soul, remember him from, Heart, from <laughs> Starsky Soul and Hutch? David Soul and I were, uh, were being overpaid to uh, do love letters in the uh, Arab Emirates. And uh, I got a call from Valerie who said, uh, I've got all these bookings. Uh, we have invested in the show. Um, we're going to lose our uh, investment unless somebody takes over the show and, and fulfills these obligations. Would you do it? Because my cancer spread. I mean, I, I, naturally, uh, I, I mean, I said yes before I knew what I was getting into, but my second phone call was uh, to my doctor. 
to find out what had happened to Valerie and why, and, 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 and whether or not it was going to happen to me. Same cancer, same surgery, no chemo, no, nothing expected. All of it was contained, stage one, same thing. Bad luck, really bad luck, but she's doing incredibly well. God bless her. She's, she's thriving on this new program, and she, her attitude about life is something that is exemplary. And she got through Dancing with the Stars, which healthy people can't do to get through. She's a wonderful girl. She's a, a hell of a broad. <laughs> she is great. But anyway, to little rant, I landed in my lap again. And I had to learn this play in eight days. So I know, I know my memory says I don't have to do Sudoku. I just have to do a play every once in a while. <laughs> my, my, my brain cells will keep functioning. Um, we toured it, we're hoping to take it to the West End in England. A lot of work has been done on the play and I think we're getting to the point that it is becoming a play rather than um, a situation comedy. And, um, and so that's, that's where that is. And so Tallulah came back into my life after all. And perhaps one day in Sedona, Looped will be seen, and then you can learn even more about Night on My Road. The William Holden Wildlife Foundation. Right, so oh, the William Holden Wildlife Foundation. Uh, uh, Bill and I shared so many, many things. Uh, in spite of the difference in our ages, there was kind of a seamlessness with some of our history professionally. He was 19 when he entered the motion picture industry. I was 15, 16. Um, he was under contract at Columbia, and so was I. He was also under contract at Paramount, which I wasn't, but I did work for them. All the people that he grew up with in the firmament of Hollywood were by the time I got into the business already well established, so, but they were still there. So we, there was a seamlessness about that. There was also um, uh, mutual curiosities were very similar, if not the same. And uh, we could be sitting in separate parts of, of the same room, reading the newspaper and come upon the same story and say, did you read about yes? <laughs> well, did you know they were yes? Would you want to go? Yes. <laughs> it could finish each other's sentences. So it was really kind of soulmates. I only got about nine years of him. It's unfortunate. Um, but I guess sometimes in life we meet people with whom we can not only share our lives, but we can um, depart uh, knowing that they have uh, the responsibilities in their hands that, uh, of the things that you value the most and that they'll carry out um, what you wanted to do in the way you wanted to do them. And he had that confidence in me because he gave me uh, that responsibility. He had always wanted to build, well, let's see, let me go back. He had come to Kenya as a, as a hunter in the mid-1950s. Uh, he told me that one day he was out hunting um, to provide food for the safari, the, the camp. Safari means trip. Uh, most safaris were associated with hunting, so they became known as hunting trips. But uh, safari is a Kiswahili name. Uh, in actual fact, it would, to a hunting trip would be called a safari kukufa wanyama. That would mean a, a trip to kill animals. There'll be a quiz later, if you're taking note. <laughs> Not a trip to photograph them. So in those days, um, uh, he and his two friends who came out to, to Kenya to catch the big five, elephant, rhino, lion, leopard, and buffalo, um, spent about three months uh, doing that. And one day he was out shooting some meat for the pot. Um, game was prolific in those days. And you only shot the males because the females were important for breeding. And other things. The girl from Uncle Speech. <laughs> <laughs> and so there's a beautiful animal called a garanuk. 
You've seen them? Yeah. Yeah, they're browsers. They don't, they, they, they stand on their hind legs to get these beautiful succulent little leaves. They have beautiful long necks with great big wide eyes. And when he went over, he was an excellent shot, so there was no suffering. He shot with, uh, uh, with one bullet um, and walked over and picked up the face of this magnificent creature. And he said, oh my God, I think I've just killed Audrey Hepburn. <laughs> And it kind of opened his brain and shifted him. He said that was sort of a defining moment. There wasn't, nobody was talking about conservation, preservation, extinction. This was the mid 1950s. Everyone was smoking and drinking and having, you know, mad men. You know, it was, uh, it was, uh, it was full steam ahead. Nothing was ever going to give out. We were on a real roll. But he and the people he was now spending time with were talking about how the herds would diminish when the population of humans started to grow. And in fact, if you really do your homework, you really, we can go back to as far as the beginning of the Industrial Revolution in the early part of the 19th century. It was said by scientists who have done studies, exhaustive studies on the, on the the effects of the beginning of the Industrial Revolution, that 80% of the biological life on this planet was destroyed because of that event. So that the remaining rapidly dwindling percentage that we're living with needs to be protected at all costs. And I mean at all costs. Because we could see it in our lifetime. And we very may well may. Certainly we may very well see the end of the elephant. Oh. Now if you feel passionately about this, because I'm going to ask you to do something. After I tell you a little bit about this, because I live there, I'm in the front lines, my fingernails are very dirty. And they're not long. I watch NGOs, these are non-governmental organizations, international good, do-gooders. Um, I watch them come and go in East Africa. I watch them use donor money indiscriminately for themselves. I see uh, corruption beyond our wildest imagination. And I see the murder of animals that are iconic uh, that, that herald the condition of the planet, their demise, heralds the condition of the planet, heralds the condition of human life, uh, and heralds the respect that we may be quickly losing for one another by the fact that we don't respect them. About four years ago, uh, men came on our ranch with AK-47s and night vision goggles and murdered our three rhino. They didn't get the horns, uh, but they were chased off. Uh, that month, seven other rhinos were murdered in our district, and that hasn't stopped. The market for rhino horn and the market for ivory, as you well know, because it's been discussed and you're all intelligent people, and you've read it all. It's in China, it's in Vietnam, and it's in Korea. And we all say, well, what, what can we do? So here's what I want to ask you to do. If you feel as passionate about this as I do, even if you just feel 50% as passionate about it as I do, and you feel hamstrung that there's nothing you can do, I'll tell you something you can do. It's the easiest thing in the world. And I look around and I look at all of you and I can see some gray hairs out there. I know we're all around the same age. You remember when you did, you stood up and you said, I'm not going to take this anymore, and you demonstrated. You took the reins of the future of the country in your hands. You didn't just lie back and die. You didn't just lie back and say, I'm, I'm ineffectual, no one's going to listen to me, I'm not going to do anything. You weren't apathetic. You were from the generation of activists, 
and you helped change the world, and you still can. All it takes, paper, not emails. Paper, a couple of pens, signing, signatures, as many as you can collect, on petitions, going straight to all the embassies I just mentioned. We will not buy any products made in your country. We will not be consumers of your products, of any products that are made in your, in your country until something and we see you demonstrating that you will prosecute, execute anyone dealing in these illegal trades of the iconic animals that are not yours to kill, but are also ours. Postage stamp, piece of paper, a little bit of your time, a lot of your friends, I'm sure you've got a lot of people who would do this. Tell everybody about it. You remember when the same thing happened years and years ago, I think it was in the 1970s, when the Japanese were the bad boys on the block and they were drift netting all the dolphins in the Pacific Ocean, catching them in their drift nets and packaging them as tuna fish. Remember that? It was before the little dolphin got on the end of the, t of the can of tuna fish. It was because of these kinds of petitions that flooded the Japanese embassy that that little fish got on that on that can, we have the power to change things. But not if we simply go home and say, well, somebody else is gonna do it. I know you, you could do it, now come on. Tell all your friends, I was, I was chatting with Stephanie Powers and she said to me, and make a difference. I think it would be a great time to open up to some questions because people may have some questions about that and some other things. Quickly before we do, I would be remiss if I didn't thank Patrick, the director of this incredible festival, for his extraordinary generosity, gifts of spirit. He's one of the loveliest men. I was in Cannes last year at the Cannes Film Festival. Sedona's my favorite. It's better here. This is as good as it gets, in my opinion. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you to Glenn Scarpelli from Sedona now, without whom I wouldn't know what Sedona was, and everybody, front of house and crew in this wonderful theater that we're in tonight. Thank all of you for all of that. And questions from anyone? Questions, you want to raise your hand? We've got about 10 minutes for audience questions. And then Ms. Powers will be outside if you want to say hello. I'd just like you to repeat those four countries again. China, Vietnam. China, Vietnam, and Korea. Bless your heart. Go out and get him, girl. <laughs> uh, raise your hand if you've got a question. Oh, thank you. While, while I'm getting the microphone right here, can you tell me, can you tell us what your favorite role has been, whether it's stage or screen? Definitely. Stephanie? Okay. Uh, my favorite role. Oh, I, all right. I guess uh, I had the great good fortune of being involved in, uh, as a producer and um, creator of a, a mini-series about an extraordinary woman who I had met. Her name was Beryl Markham. She was the first person to ever fly across the Atlantic solo going west. Lindbergh said it couldn't be done. He flew east. He said, you couldn't carry enough, you'd be a bomb. You couldn't carry enough fuel. You'd be in the headwinds. It would, she did it. She I was born in South Africa, but she grew up in Kenya. And uh, she had a brief period of time in the United States, but uh, she wound up being a great aviatrix. She was a horse trainer. She was uh, uh, an extraordinary character. Uh, I only met her toward the end of her life, and I went over to her house. She lived at the racetrack, and I went there with a fellow I knew, uh, another pilot, and she was really interested in talking to him and having the bottle of vodka we brought. <laughs> so she wasn't really much interested in me, but at least I had a chance to say I had met her. And that was a real thrill. It was a three-hour miniseries. It was called Shadow on the Sun. <laughs> Thank you for being here. You have an audience right here that, you know, has been in love with you during your whole career. We could listen Thank to you all the time. I'm in love with you. Do you have any great stories about doing the clinic with, with John Wayne? 
Oh God, I just loved him. John Wayne was everything you expected, everything you expected, and the most gracious man on the planet. We were filming in Tucson, um, south of Tucson in Nogales, and uh, Tombstone, and mostly southern Arizona, uh, we, McClintock. And, uh, and Pilar, uh, uh, Duke's wife, uh, went home, and his son Patrick and I sort of wound up always uh, looking after Patrick and I was sort of smitten with each other. And, um, and we were taken to dinner, and we played chess with him, and he beat us, the two of us, he beat, I mean, he was a most fabulous chess player. And uh, uh, every time we'd go to a restaurant or anything, he couldn't even get a spoonful in his mouth uh, when somebody would stop to ask him for an autograph or something, you know, and I remember saying to him, don't you get tired of that? I mean, like you can't even eat your dinner. He said, it's when they stop doing it that it's time to worry. He was very, very grateful and very gracious for the support, as am I, for the support uh, that he had over his lifetime and the support that people give us. Uh, you make us who we are. Your support and your uh, interest in our careers uh, you're the people we work for and uh, hopefully make happy. He was uh, a great man. And I had the privilege of knowing him uh, long after the movie was over. And, uh, and I was sort of a kind of a member of the family, so I was always invited to family things. And... We have a question, question back here. <laughs> yes, I have a, more of a comment. I want to thank uh, both of you, Mark, and you, Stephanie, for being here. My, uh, uh, my thanks uh, personally to both of you. And after watching this film tonight, my wife turned to me and said, see, your mother wasn't so bad after all. <laughs> that's a good line. That's as good as anything. If, if there aren't any more questions, that's as good as any to close on. <laughs> we'll have one final question. Well, there's one we more. have something we'd love to give you. I have a question about Lionel. Wasn't he a big star in the 30s? Was it his studio? Oh, Lionel Standard. You know, they used to, they used to call, at a certain point, Lionel Standard was not only a big star, he produced films on, uh, uh, plays on Broadway. And at a certain point, I mean, he was a great character in, in New York. But at a certain point, they used to call it, uh, uh, you know, Standard's Broadway, because he either had a, uh, a show he was acting in, or had directed, or had produced on Broadway uh, on many, many occasions, simultaneously appearing. When he was, uh, oh, he was a great womanizer, and he was, a great, I mean, he was one of the great characters of all time. But he was a bit of an anarchist, too, you know, and, uh, during that dreadful period of time called the McCarthy period, uh, he was blacklisted. Uh, he left Hollywood. Uh, he was married to someone at the time whose father had a seat on the stock exchange and Lionel tried to be a stockbroker. Dismal failure. But he wound up living in Europe and he made 50 films in Europe during that period of time, one of which was really a, a brilliant film that uh, called Cul de Sac. Uh, directed by Polanski, uh, Roman Polanski. Um, when uh, the dust died and uh, Lionel, uh, uh, Robert Wagner ran into Lionel, Robert Wagner knew Lionel in Rome because RJ had a moment in his career where things were sagging and there was lots of work for, for young actors in, in Rome and, and during the, uh, the late 50s, early 60s. And, he knew Lionel, who was the king, he was the king of the Via Veneto. He used to walk up and down the Via Veneto with two blondes on either side. <laughs> Blonde on either side, oh my God. He had his regular seat, his, his regular table at Donny's. Oh, he was such a character. Famous, famous man. And what a wonderful human being he was. Well, we just, we would like to thank you, Stephanie. Um, I have a wonderful I human you. being. I know the two of you talked for five and a half hours last night. I could have listened to you for five and a half hours tonight, couldn't we have? Um, well, thank you so much. I'm so grateful for you, for your support for coming this evening, but also for your support at this wonderful festival. It's getting bigger and better and wonderful, and it's, it really has a fabulous reputation, and that's because of your support, so thank you very thank you, much. Thank you, thank you, and I want to also comment on something that Stephanie just said, because 
they kind of broke the mold on this generation of star and celebrity because you said something very profound here that, that a couple other celebrities have alluded to this week, that these are the people who made you who you are, and you work for them. And you said that, Shirley Knight said that the other day, uh, Ed Asner earlier this evening, it's, a, it's, not, it's lost on the generations of today's Hollywood. And we just want to applaud you for remembering that we love you. We may have made you, but my God, you're just amazing, and we love you. We have a special award we'd like to present to Stephanie. I'm going to go on here so we can have a little Stephanie Powers sandwich. Um, and we're going to present oh. you. <laughs> we're going to present you. That didn't Hold the mayo. Out. That didn't come out. No, that didn't. That didn't. But never mind. We'll just gloss over that. Later on. <laughs> Our 2014 Lifetime Achievement Award and Humanitarian Award presented to Stephanie Powers in honor of your lifetime passion and dedication to acting, your commitment to the art of the cinema. In recognition of your outstanding career of bringing memorable characters to life on stage and screen, and in appreciation of your humanitarian efforts and your devotion to animal protection and preservation, thank you for sharing your passion and making a difference in the world. Stephanie Powers. Ladies and gentlemen.